Tokenmetrics is a cryptocurrency investment platform that helps users leverage machine learning to become better crypto investors. Our in-depth analysis helps eliminate the emotions of investing, find profitable investment opportunities, and filters out scams. Learn more at tokenmetrics.com. Disclaimer. Tokenmetrics Media LLC does not provide individually tailored investment advice and does not take a subscriber's or anyone's personal circumstance into consideration when discussing investments nor is registered as an investment advisor or broker-dealer in any jurisdiction. Information contained herein is not an offer or solicitation to buy, hold, or sell any security. The Tokenmetrics team has advised and invested in many blockchain companies. A complete list of their advisory roles and current holdings can be viewed here at tokenmetrics.com slash disclosures. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we have the pleasure of being joined by Micah Turpin, all the way from Puerto Rico who is a legend in the space, early blockchain investor, very, very successful entrepreneur. Michael, how are you? Welcome on the show. I'm doing great. Great to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So hope uh, everything is all right with the, with the quarantine. Um, I, I know over here in DC, things are pretty hectic. I've been here at home for almost three weeks straight. Uh, so it's, it's, it's good to just kind of have people to talk to who are also yeah. really big in the space. Well, wow. Go ahead. We are in our we are in our fourth week here. Um, the media, uh, national media, gets it wrong when they say the Bay Area was the first to be locked down. Mm -hmm. San Juan was three days prior to the Bay Area, and so um, uh, Governor uh, Juan de Vesquez, um, you know, really took the bull by the horns very early. And so we're in our fourth week right now, and I think it's really helped a lot. We're at about a quarter of the national average for infections, and about a uh, about a quarter of the national average for deaths as well. So. All right, um, awesome, awesome. You know, well, uh, I still be under lock and key for a while too, so we'll see. <laughs> All right, so for those people who may not know you, or maybe they're being exposed to you for the first time, kind of walk us through who is Michael. Sure. So um, 
I am a, uh, I like to say, a parallel serial entrepreneur in, uh, in marketing and technology. And um, I'm uh, probably best known for a lot of the things I've done in the PR world, uh, including newswire creation. Um, I uh, started out just, I mean, at, at heart, I'm a writer. Um, that's really my first passion. I kind of mm -hmm. knew I wanted to do something in writing when in first grade, they gave an assignment and you were supposed to go home and write a story and come back and everybody else had one or two paragraphs and I had typed out like an eight page story. So everybody like said, who the hell is this kid? So <laughs> eight pages, ever since wow. then I, yeah, at that, at that point I knew that I wanted to, uh, you know, either be a newspaper reporter or a magazine editor and uh, went to Syracuse um, uh, Newhouse School, which is the top journalism school in the country. I grew up in upstate New York, uh, Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, you know, quickly when I got out, I found that what I really wanted to do, which is write magazine articles, there were no jobs for those. Most magazine articles are sort of freelance and um, they're oftentimes to promote other projects. And so very hard getting a, um, you know, sort of a, and it's also hard to, to go and find a job as the great American novelist. That usually is not uh, something that you find on Craigslist. Uh -huh. So, uh, so I discovered PR um, after chasing fire trucks and going to city hall meetings as a cub reporter in upstate New York. Um, uh, I was the staff reporter uh, for Potsdam, New York at the Watertown, New York Daily Times. Uh, one of the few uh, award-winning newspapers in the country that had more subscribers than people who lived in the city because they actually covered the entire top third of uh, New York State, a very rural area. Uh -huh. um, and it's different for me growing up in you know the east side of Buffalo. So um, I uh, discovered PR when I was offered, uh, I was covering four colleges in the area uh, for their news beats and the position of PR director at Clarkson College of Technology, now called Clarkson University, came up and I was encouraged by the gentleman who was retiring to apply for it. I did, found I was good at it. And, um, you know, that sort of started my career at, you know, age 23 or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, really, I've always loved technology. I've always been a gadget guy. I've got two brothers, uh, one who went to MIT, graduated with honors in artificial technology. Uh, the mm -hmm. other one's got degrees in um, physics and chemical engineering. So I think he's got three or four degrees. So uh, definitely grew up in kind of a geeky household, um, you know, where people would like make their own computers out of spare parts uh, back <laughs> in the day. And um, so really what I ended up doing for most of my career kind of put the two together. When I started my own agency, first agency was called the Turpin Group. Um, and that was sort of a early uh, agency in the, dot com era uh and i and i basically was living in los angeles at that point and i did not want to start a celebrity pr firm because i knew there were seven thousand of them out there and so i was like what's growing faster than the than the than the economy where i can add value and i thought well let me look it up um technology and medical were both growing faster than the economy mm -hmm. and i thought technology particularly gadgets games things like that were something that i could learn about quickly and so that I would be able to explain it to the editors and then editors would always call me for story ideas. And that's pretty much what I've, you know, run all of my PR agencies on the theory is get ahead of the game, get close to the reporters, hire other people who are also curious about the technology and have the same philosophy. And so I went from early video games um, representing companies like Konami um, and, you know, some other big uh, Japanese conglomerates like Fujitsu and um, um, Tiak and Shinan introduced the very first digital camera um, back when it was $1,100 and took eight photos in black mm -hmm. and white. And that was an innovation because you didn't have to process it. Yeah. We've come a long way, obviously, that we're on Zoom. <laughs> uh, we actually worked with Zoom in the early days um, doing oh, some PR pretty cool. as well. So. So I, I usually find it's my job to, as, as the entrepreneur, to find cool companies to work with. And I've definitely been more successful um, investing in those companies than just taking the PR fees. Okay. So I'm always looking when I work in, in my first firm, the Turpin Group, which 
I sold, um, you know, right at the top of the PR uh, of the dot com bubble, thankfully. Um, good timing. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was good timing. I mean, timing's <laughs> everything in these markets. Um, you know, I was able to, um, you know, uh, invest in in about thirty of the companies that I did PR for, and and you know, a lot of times it would be because I thought they had a really good um, company, and um, I was able when they were bootstrapping to give them the PR budget they needed um, without them having to, you know, spend all their angel money or in some cases their, you know, their, their money mm-hmm. off their credit cards. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I had an, an article on front page of Inc. back then uh, about what I, I had done and a few other entrepreneurs who sort of had that same philosophy um, of, you know, sort of investing in, in, in companies and how you did that. And um, I think I had about 35 companies in the 90s that I invested in who I also did work for. And, you know, venture economics, 90% of them either became lifestyle businesses or went out of business. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I only got returns from five of the companies out of 35, which I'm told is better than DC returns. But mm-hmm. one of them was a, a 50X. Not bad, not that bad. Paid, that, paid, that paid for everybody else. So quick question. <coughs> what was the, the process like in terms of investing in companies and also doing PR for them? Was there a different evaluation <coughs> process? Did you first evaluate a project or a company as something you want to invest in and then do PR? Or was it first do PR, then if you like it, choose to invest? Uh, you know, it's a great question. Um, in general, they would come in through both doors. Some mm-hmm. companies would come in because they heard that I was an angel investor. Um, other companies would come in because they needed PR and they knew that we knew how to get people on, you know, front page of the Wall Street Journal or the USA Today or whatever. And, um, you know, the, the ones that I, um, that really, really wanted me to invest in them, um, were, were usually the ones that I didn't because, you know, they spent most of the time not developing their product, but going out mm-hmm. trying to find investors. Um, the ones that I did the best that were the ones where I really had to twist their arm to let me invest in them. Yeah. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah. The, the harder it is, the easier it is sometimes in a way. Right. And the other thing also is that I really, I, I like the model of investing in companies that I think are my, my big winners because we, we're, we're sharing the risk, right? And mm-hmm. we're also sharing the rewards. If, um, if I, you know, and my company turns someone from, you know, kind of a hard, somebody who's hard to differentiate in a crowded space and, you know, make them one of the big winners, um, you know, it's nice to be able to, you know, have, have some equity in that. And um, similarly, if um, I'm not able to either kind of coalesce with their messaging or to be able to then convince the media um, about the importance of the company, then, and they fail, then, you know, we end up sharing the loss because my equity becomes worth nothing. Right, right. I, I, as, so with us, with 100X Advisors, we also do investing and advisory as well. And we've definitely been yeah. in, in, in that case where, especially with crypto tokens in the last few years where yeah. most of them pretty much went to nothing. So I, I can yeah. definitely feel everything you've gone through. So when we get to the most recent one, I've also obviously advised the companies too. Mm-hmm. And when the crypto token world came out, um, you know, people would say, well, yeah, I, I want PR, but I really want you as an advisor because you're an OG and you're well known. Mm-hmm. And uh, you also know a lot of investors because you started Dead Angels. So I'll flip through the middle part from yeah, go ahead. Um, when I saw the agency, um, in uh, uh, 2000 at the same time that early 2000 at the same time that I took um, money for a spinoff that I had um, because while I was running the agency, I also um, came up with some ideas to do things on my own or with partners, um, making me a, what I call a parallel serial entrepreneur. So I'd be doing several things at the same time. And um, during the nineties um, I had one, that worked really well and one that was a little too early for its time, but it was a good idea and perhaps the wrong team. Um, but the, the one that uh, didn't do as well, we raised a couple hundred thousand and went bust was called direct IPO started in April of 1996, um, had a partner who was a stockbroker, Um, and he was sort of the one who was the risk mitigator. And I think he was, you know, at the end of the day, probably we were, being too, we would always ask the lawyers and the lawyers would say, you can't do that. And it was basically the first equity crowdfunding company. 
And that was back in the day oh, where wow. you didn't even have Blue Sky, the Blue Sky Act. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to go state by state. And as soon as I announced it, and we got, you know, all over the place coverage, we got, you know, um, a, a half a page in, in print and fortune. We got, you know, NPR, we got all this coverage. And then a couple of days later, I get a call from the SEC saying, what are you doing? And we sat mm -hmm. with the, you know, several SEC commissioners, explained our model. I said, okay, this doesn't sound like you're breaking any laws right now, but read the laws, uh, make sure you have good lawyers and we'll get back to you if we think there's any problems. Mm -hmm. And so we hired a big, you know, um, financial firm in Philadelphia for some reason, we were in LA and everything we said we wanted to do, they said, no, you can't do that. And the same month, uh, WIT Capital launched and their CEO was a securities lawyer. And so mm -hmm. everything that our firm said, no, you can't do that. That'll be $50,000, please. Um, he did <laughs> and got a no action letter and sold his company for, I think it was about $300 million. Wow. To wow. Quite the exit. Which they, then, which they then shut it down because they didn't want the competition. I would have been happy wow. to take $100 million to be shut down. But, uh -huh. uh, we didn't get that far because, uh, you know, what I learned over the years is um, find a lot of great lawyers find a lot of them who have different opinions, take their opinions, pay them for their opinions, um, get cocktail conversations for the real opinions, and then mm -hmm. make your own choice because they will usually err on the side of extreme caution and extreme billing. It's just their nature. <laughs> and so you have to well decide said. what's the worst case that can happen. And it's even more so in these days. And we'll get to that for later in the, uh, in the process because I'm Fairly been out, I've been fairly outspoken on a lot of these uh, issues since I started Good Angels. Yeah. But, um, and, you know, and, you know, that company could have been my first huge home run. Um, instead, I ended up going back to a company I was simultaneously incubating in the back of uh, my PR firm, which was in Marina del Rey at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, they were chugging along. I gave them a little bit of angel funding and, uh, they were bootstrapping and all of a sudden they had, uh, you know, a couple, a couple of hundred clients. And, uh, it was my idea that I actually had in 1992 that the PR business was horse and buggy, uh, in terms of its tools, you had paper directories of media that you would buy mm -hmm. and they would then have little old ladies clip out, uh, um, um, you know, articles and send it to you in the mail. All this has been digital for a long time now. But I saw in 1992 that the internet was going to go and slowly put all these, you know, brick and mortar horse and buggy models out of business. And I looked and saw what is, is the largest amount of money in the PR services business. And it was Newswires. And it was controlled by two companies, um, Business Wire and PR Newswire. PR Newswire um, invented the concept of the, of the press Newswire. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Herbert Michelle who... Um, a uh, little known fact, except for other people who know the Newswire business, he created two companies in his life. One was PR Newswire. The other was TV Guide. Oh, TV Guide. Yeah. He started TV Guide and he sold it to Annenberg. And then he started PR Newswire. And back then, PR Newswire truly was a wire. It used Western Union. It was a teletype. Mm -hmm. And what the model was, was that if you had really important breaking news, you wanted to have the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and all these other top outlets to know about it at the same time, um, you would hire him and he would go and put it on the PR newswire that would use Western Union and they would get a telegram. And it would just have the headlines of like the breaking news for that day. And then if they wanted the whole story, you would then send the story by a telegram if they needed it immediately. This was in 1953. Incredible. And they were the only ones in the business. <laughs> and uh, that was their model. And he ran it out of his, uh, his brownstone in Brooklyn for years. Uh, I think moved to Manhattan uh, after that. But it was, mm -hmm. it was in New York City area. And the only competition that came out from the next decade was Business Wire, which decided to have the new technology of using satellite. And Laurie Loquet um, was a, a reporter at UPI. And he came up with the idea of like, hey, why don't you use satellites quicker um, mm -hmm. then, um, and, and more, more efficient and you don't have to have them go back and forth, um, uh, then, um, then, 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 uh, Western Union and it's already going, the AP Newswire, the AP feed is already going into all the big daily newspapers, TV stations and radio stations. And his boss at UPI said, that's the craziest idea. Why would we want to have this 
PR garbage. We, we're, we're a news organization. So he went to AP and AP said, we can work something out. We'll put it in this little trash bucket saying junk news releases. Look at it if you want to, so you don't get too much mail. And they quoted him a price. He marked it up by, and that's how the satellite newswire business was born. And they were West Coast. PR Newswire quickly made their own deal with AP, and they sort of started reselling issues on the servers, the services, East Coast and West Coast. And one day, I think it took to the 80s for this to happen, they kind of started opening up offices. They met around the Rockies and declared war on each other. And then they became full on competitors like they are today. And they've since been sold. Um, Business Wire is now owned by Berkshire Hathaway. Um, Warren Buffett. Larry did very well mm -hmm. at Berkshire Hathaway. He bought it in, uh, I think it was 2006. Uh, 2006 was the year that all the news wires seemed to have gotten sold, including Market Wire, which is the one I started. Um, and um, uh, Pierre Newswire um, is now owned, has had some, had originally sold to Western Union and then got sold to a British conglomerate, been sold a few times. It's now part of Cision, which also owns um, the largest um, um, online um, clipping service and for news to show you where your stories have been placed and the largest um, directory of, uh, of journalists. Um, it was originally called Bacon's and that was because his name was Lewis Bacon, um, started those things that were the directories that you would pay a couple thousand dollars. They have a book published four times a year with the journalists. So kind of like a and catalog or some. It was a catalog else? back in the brick and mortar days. This was started in the 19, I think fifties as well, fifties or sixties. So as I predicted in the nineties, everything eventually came to the internet and now, you know, they've been gobbled up and they're owned by a few conglomerates. So, um, the company I started, Internet Wire, was the first one to go and say, forget about satellite and fax. Fax came in, in the 80s, and that actually exponentially grew the marketplace because you could buy a package that would go and fax it to trade publications because not everybody has a satellite dish from the Associated Press. It's only a couple hundred members. It's just the, the Associated Press was started in the Civil War so that they didn't all have to send the reporter out to get killed to get the story. Oh, wow. So they'd say, okay, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. New York Times, you send someone to cover Gettysburg and, you know, Philadelphia Inquirer, you send someone to go cover this battlefield. And that's why they got started. They're, they're, they're an industry kind of non, non, not for profit association, um, like the Guild, I guess. And they've been around since the, they were started in the Civil War. And they're very profitable, but they're still a not for profit association of the newspaper industry. And, um, one of the things they do to make money is they sell access to their satellite, uh, both video and text. And in the early 90s, when I was really diving deeply into the internet uh, and starting to represent some early internet clients like America Online and Earthlink, um, we, I just looked and said, why do you need a satellite to distribute text? Press releases are text, mm -hmm. maybe a small photo. The internet's very good for this. And so I started developing this in, I thought of it in 92, started developing it as like a BBS service and then discovered, you know, the Mosaic browser in 93. And I was like, nope, that's the way to go. And so I uh, started building it out as uh, Internet Wire. Um, it was originally called uh, GINA, the Global Internet News Agency, and Internet Wire was one of its services. Uh, if you mm -hmm. look at GINA.com, which I think is now a, shoe company but um if you look on the internet way back you know the machine the, the way back machine yeah um from about 94 you'll see the gina website it was actually now pretty 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 cool design for 94. so what was it like building an internet company in the early 90s because it seems almost kind of the same way nowadays people are building blockchain companies where maybe you feel you're so early maybe too early what was the the thought process and experience like yeah, I mean, I got laughed at by a lot of people saying the internet's going nowhere. I sort of stuck to my guns just like I, I do with blockchain. Um, I did have, it helps to have um, uh, a strategic advantage. And one strategic advantage I had was the building where I had my office. So mm -hmm. I had my office in the Twin Towers in Marina Del Rey. And the I was on floor five of the South Tower. 
floor nine through 12 was the Information Sciences Institute of USC. Okay. USC was one of the first four universities to be the internet. They, they got the grant from uh, the defense department. From DARPA? And the very first, uh, from DARPA, yeah. yeah. And so in 1969, um, that's where they started. It was Stanford, USC, UCLA, and the University of Utah. And the very first, um, you know what the first message? You know how on teletype, uh, or rather on, on the telephone with Graham Bell, the very first message ever sent was, you know, uh, Watson, I need you because uh, Thomas Edison spilled a cup of coffee on himself. Uh, <laughs> do you know what the first message ever sent on the internet was? Uh, no idea. L O. L O. Just type L O, as in lo and behold, or uh -huh. <laughs> um, hello in as short of, of number of characters as you can yeah. say. And that was sent from Leonard Kleinrock to Stanford. And nobody even like took a picture of the moment. There wasn't video back then, really, other than TV mm -hmm. cameras, um, as opposed to. And then the teletype, um, the first message that was sent by Samuel Morris was, what hath God wrought? As in, oh, my mm -hmm. God, the teletype in modern communications is going to change the world. And it did. That was really the first time that you could send a message to somebody who wasn't you know, kind of near you. And now, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> we're here talking like a normal conversation, seeing every gesture and we're on Zoom. And so, are, you know, many other people seeing it on YouTube and other things, and they can be in the Zoom room. So yeah. it's, it's, it's incredible. But it really all started, it started with, uh, with Samuel Morris, really, and, uh, and, and, and medicine. And um, so uh, with Internet Wire, we were the first uh, to add Internet to the equation because when the fax machine came in, in the 80s, both Business Wire and Pure Newswire were able to add all the vertical publications, all the tech publications, and fax things to them. They would also have an investor uh, kit where they could say, if you want to get the latest news before other investors, you can go and subscribe and pay us, and you'll get fax of all the latest headlines in your category. And they would sell that as an upsell um, as the investor package um, that investors would go now, now, of course, it automatically appears on Google, on Yahoo uh, Finance, so they, they can't upsell it anymore. But back in the 80s, that was a big thing in the early mm -hmm. 90s, and they made a lot of money on that. Yeah. And then I came around and wrecked the game by putting things on the Internet. So um, <laughs> we uh, built it out in 93, and we launched it in 1994. And, um, you know, again, crazy early, I launched it at a conference called uh, the Interactive Marketing Conference. Everybody except for us was um, CD-ROM companies. And there was a bunch of ad agencies there. And I literally got questions from like big ad agency executives coming up and saying, so do I have to pay this end recent guy every time I go on the internet? <laughs> uh, no. Can I make mm -hmm. a deal to put like an ad on the internet without having to pay end recent? Uh, yeah, oh, that's good to know. I didn't want to have to deal with him as the middleman. So they had no <laughs> idea back when Netscape first came out. And of course, mm -hmm. I actually got my first browser when he was still in college. You had to go and download it. Um, the original Mosaic was a, was a project out of the uh, University of Illinois at uh, Carbondale, uh, where Larry Smaros got a big uh, a grant. Um, he then went on to run the, he also did Apache, by the way. He's like, you know, legendary in terms of getting great big government grants to, um, to, to do great projects. He's now at the Supercomputer Institute in, uh, in uh, San Diego. Um, but, you know, it was really, it was crazy early days. I mean, uh, Larry Smyers, I, I, I've met, and um, he told me once that um, when dot-com came out and companies started registering the names, because back then it was the National Science Foundation, until I think, I think it was about 95 that they finally turned it over to, uh, to Network Solutions to manage as a private company. They didn't charge you for domain names. You just registered oh, really? for free. Wow. Yeah. And, um, and, and the people were asking Larry when they mm -hmm. came up with the, um, the dot com, they said, what are these companies doing on our internet? This is supposed to be for government and university. What do they <laughs> want to do with the internet? You know, mm -hmm. and this was like, you know, this was like in the nineties. I mean, I, I remember like it's yesterday and it's obviously you know, it's 30 years ago now, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, I, I feel like we're in those days right now in the blockchain. And I think we've been past 
our dot com moment. Um, and you know, you, you know, the dot coms after they popped, everybody said, "What were we thinking?" You know, Netflix will never be blockbuster. People want to go into the comfort of the store. Barnes and Nobles is going to crush Amazon into the dust. What were we mm-hmm. thinking? You know, there's no such thing as e-commerce. The e-commerce global market is about as large as like my neighborhood shopping mall. And it just takes time and it takes GUI. It takes a good user interface. And I think that's what's going to happen with uh, with blockchain as well. I mean, I can see it in my mind how it's going to play out over the next 10 or 15 mm-hmm. years where you're not even going to mention blockchain any more than you mentioned TCP, IP or internet. I mean, mm-hmm. when you got in here, do you think, oh, I'm going to do an internet call. No, mm-hmm. you're doing a Zoom call. You're, it's already implied that you're on the internet. Yeah, it's already assumed. So how do you get involved with blockchain? So blockchain, um, so fast forward with um, uh, selling the agency um, and then getting funded for, for, uh, for Internet Wire by Sequoia Capital after, mm-hmm. I, after I got an angel round in the early 2000s, um, uh, built Internet Wire up. I did a deal with NASDAQ after the word Internet went, went from being meaning all things good to all things bad. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, we did a strategic deal with NASDAQ who came in as a strategic investor. And, you know, that really, you know, fired up the company's growth and uh, they were reselling things for us. And then we sold the company in 2006. We thought we were going to sell to NASDAQ, but we got a higher bid from another company um, uh, that did a leveraged buyout because that was very popular in 06, 07. And that company then sold to a big hedge fund in Toronto, Homer's Capital. They ran it for a number of years and then they sold it back to NASDAQ for about three or four times the price that NASDAQ could have bought it for um, <laughs> back then. And um, sucked all the money up, put that in like mm-hmm. most PE groups do. I mean, I presume they did. Um, and, um, and then um, NASDAQ uh, uh, bundled it up with a couple of other things um, and sold it to uh, Apollo Global Management's Centrado division uh, for $335 million. Um, Not bad. Last. Not bad. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah, so it's good. My baby keeps growing, and every time it gets sold, uh, it, um, mm. it grow, it, uh, it's for a bigger number. But uh, I think it will probably stay there. Now, now, how did you feel when you sold the company? Was it something you wanted to do? Were you do, do, were you trying to move on to other ideas? Were you just kind of no? Exhausted? Actually, in that in, in that case, I wanted to uh, keep it going for longer, and I lost a board fight where uh, mm-hmm. I said we still have several million dollars in the bank. We're profitable. Um, let's wait until. Um, we at least are paying taxes because we didn't even burn through the money we raised. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, you know, the, the board members were like nervous that, you know, they got an offer that was for like, you know, five times trailing revenue. They thought that was good enough. And they knew we weren't going to be Google and mm-hmm. they wanted us to at least show up in the win column. And mm-hmm. I was like, we'll get the same offer a year from now, but I'm big in numbers. Because at the time, I think we, that first sale was for 35 million. And I think we had about like 7 million and change trailing revenue. We were at a 12 million run rate and we were making 200,000 bucks a month, paying no taxes on it because we hadn't you know, paid back our net operating loss. Mm-hmm. And um, I was right, they were wrong because the company that bought it from us sold it a year later for 100 million. Yeah. I mean, so, we just hired a rock star sales manager, but you know, that's fine. It let me move on to other things more quickly. Um, I then went and said, what's the next big thing? Um, and prior to blockchain, I thought of it social media. And so in 2006, I started a company called Social Radius. And um, that was one of the earlier social media marketing companies. And so back to working with, you know, big companies who had Marriott and Philips as clients. And, and then all of a sudden I got people asking when I got into blockchain a few years later, um, uh, do you just do Twitter and Facebook and viral videos or do you do PR too? It's like, oh, we do PR. I, PR, I like to say, is like being in the mob. It's like, it, it's hard to get out of it. I think that was the mm-hmm. line from like a Scarface or one of the Pacino movies. It's like, you keep mm-hmm. you keep trying to get out, but they keep dragging yeah, you back they, in. They, yeah, they keep bringing you back in. <laughs> keep bringing you back in. That's, that's the way of yeah. being in PR. I keep trying to get out and they keep dragging me back in. <laughs> um, so, um, so Transform Group basically spun out of social radius. And I got into, at that point, we were doing about 50-50 mix of uh, social media for big companies and still, you know, kind of startup PR for smaller companies that I would invest into. 
Um, or at least I wouldn't ask for some of them. Mm-hmm. And so that was just sort of like, you know, how we, you know, made our way through the 08, 09 recession and the, the times thereafter. And, um, and then 2013, um, I discovered uh, Bitcoin. And I probably could have discovered it a year earlier because um, I, was, I, had a, I had a client that had a conference in 2012 where uh, Trade Hill, which is the first U.S. Bitcoin um, exchange, was the keynote speaker. And I had two conferences, I think that or ad tech, and I chose to go to ad tech instead. And I sent the head of my San Francisco office, and I said, anything interesting? She said, nah, not really. If I had gone in 2012, I would have said the exact same reaction I did in 2013. Oh, my God, this is going to change the world. Read the white paper, see what's going on. Um, I was reminded by the uh, co-founder of Trade Hill that the price of Bitcoin in 2012, when I had a ticket to see them, and I would have learned a year earlier, was $4. When I actually got into it, it was $120. Again, (laughs) considerably lower than today, but a 30-inch difference in yeah, terms of um, you know where mistake. I could have gotten in the first time so mm-hmm. um but uh, I got involved in 2013 um from a client that um I had worked on a lot of their gaming uh, uh companies Brock Pierce who of course is a well-known uh, yeah. OG himself OG as well. in in uh, several years earlier than me and you know had been involved in mining and had uh you know really um you know even before Bitcoin we were promoting him as the father of virtual currency from what he did in, you know, the uh, early 2000s with IGE with, uh, you know, uh, selling, uh, you know, virtual lives and World of Warcraft and weapons and swords and things like that. And so he was sort of the uh, the arms broker of that space and built a company that had $700 million in sales and sold it. <clears throat> but we had offices about, about a block apart in Santa Monica. Um, and, um, you know, we, we did been friends for about a decade at that point. And, um, and I was working on one or two of his gaming companies and, uh, he comes running into running down the alley into my office in Santa Monica <laughs> and, uh, the third street promenade, um, and said, uh, I'm dropping all my gaming stuff. And I'm going full in on Bitcoin. And, you know, he sat down and explained this whole philosophy and we were going to launch a company called GoCoin. Um, I was there when we were brainstorming what to call the company. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did that actually at our, at our table in my office. And um, uh, that was the first Bitcoin Foundation conference. And he oh, decided wow. to, to not launch there because he was concerned about U.S. jurisdiction. And so he wanted to go and see if he you know, could perhaps reincorporate it or incorporate a parent company in Singapore or Malta. And so he pulled back and he said, you go on your own. He goes, I guarantee you'll be the only PR guy there. And, um, you know, you'll probably pick up a lot of business. And I did go on my own. And that was a, I'd say there were probably three, oh my God, this is going to change the world um, moments that I've had in my life. Um, and at least two, and two of the three were like seminal, um, you know, changing moments in, in, my, in my life as well as in, in the technologies changing the world. Uh, one was when I first saw Mosaic and, um, you know, realized that uh, the internet was not just the, you know, kind of do it on a unit computer that I saw my, my, my brother's accounts at, at university. Um, that was like, you know, Archie and Finger and Veronica and all these obscure tools. Um, it was literally click lube.fr and you're in the loop walking around, albeit with, you know, not 3 DVR yet, but seeing pictures from lube. And I saw that in 1993, and I was like, okay, this is going to change the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd say 2001, when I saw my first social network. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting messages here. I don't know if that's showing up on your screen as well. but Uh, No, no, it's fine. Okay, good. (laughs) Of course, my Facebook thing's coming. I should probably (laughs) turn off access. No worries. At any rate. Okay. Um, And then uh, literally, as I stood there, after the opening day of, um, of um, the, the Bitcoin Foundation, the initial Bitcoin Foundation conference in San Jose in uh, May of 2013, I was like, this is as big as the internet, what do I do? And that night um, at the opening cocktail party, I met David Johnston. And uh, we became fast friends and obviously king, kindred spirits. And uh, I noticed that day on the show floor 
that um, there were two announcements made by, you know, sizable VCs, um, uh, Andreessen Horowitz, and um, had announced the seed round in, in, in Ripple, um, and $2 million. And um, uh, there was an A round announced by uh, Union Square that uh, I think Andreessen Horowitz was already in um, for $5 million for Coinbase. These are now multi-billion dollar valuations for companies. Yeah, and huge companies. They, you know, they, they probably got in at, uh, you know, if it's standard VC terms, they were probably in at, you know, 10, $20 million valuations at the most. And now they're, you know, multi, you know, 10, $20 billion valuation. So a uh, thousand X is always a nice return if you're in that fund. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the ones you dream of. And those are the, those are the, the you know, really astute VCs that, you know, get there first and, 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 and get the deal. And so I looked at that and I said, wow, if the smartest guys in Silicon Valley and, and, and Silicon Alley um, are, you know, investing in, in blockchain, why am I not seeing any angels? Or if there are angels, why are they not, you know, connecting with each other? And so I asked David, um, while I'm having a beer on the rooftop at the opening party, um, is there any angel group in this space? He goes, no, people usually go in like Reddit or Bitcoin talk and they sort of like, you know, network and they let somebody know that maybe they found some deal or whatever. And, and I go, so there's no angel group in, 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 in Bitcoin. And he's like, and instead of the actual, the average person saying no, David said, no, why don't we start one? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, I'm kind of busy with a lot of this stuff now, but this is probably pretty important. So sure, why not? Let's do it. And I came up with the name Bit Angels right there. And David then, being a man of action, took out his phone and said, let me go grab the domain. And bitangels.com was taken by the CEO of Kraken, Jesse Powell, <laughs> who to this day will not sell to me. It just leads directly to Kraken. Um, Jesse, if you're out there, <laughs> at any rate, I got bitangels.network.io, you, know, you name it. But, um, um, and so we started, uh, we decided to have an opening um, a membership uh, a gathering at the conference because everybody was already there. And so I uh, put a note out on Reddit to get six or seven people uh, together. We got 30 people to sit at a lunch table during the, the last day of the show. We had Roger Veer there, Bitcoin Jesus. We had Benny Lingham there. We had um, Jared Kenna from Trade Hill. We had uh, Charles Castorio who now runs ZitBit, who was with a venture firm at the time. And, uh, you know, some really powerful names came in. And by the end of the week, we had 60 uh, investors in, in the decentralized kind of, uh, you know, network, um, or distributed rather. It wasn't online as a node or anything, but it was distributed, mm -hmm. um, kind of past the hat network. And, um, and you know, we, uh, um, we started having... Uh, monthly meetings, uh, much like uh, we're doing now virtually. Um, and then occasionally we would get together at conferences and just do meetups. But um, we had 600 members uh, by the end of the year and it was all just for deal flow. We didn't charge any membership fees. We didn't charge anything for the companies to present. We just sort of like, people would like, you know, recommend things and we would just like look through them and uh, we would pick three or four every, a month and then just put it out there and archive it and people would come in and look and decide who wanted to invest just like a you know it's, it's just like you know the new york angels or um Caretsu forum or uh uh you know a band of angels in new york i mean in the bay area um except instead of being geographically um uh centralized and across multiple verticals we were global across one vertical of blockchain Mm -hmm. At that time, they didn't call it blockchain, they just called it Bitcoin. Bitcoin we were yeah. looking to fund wallets, exchanges, um, colored coins, you know, just all the technologies that were happening in 2013. And then David and I, along with two other uh, general partners, started a Bit Angels fund the next year called the Bit Angels DAP, DAPS Fund. And um, that was a structured, you know, an LLC, LLP. Um, we raised a whopping six million dollars in Bitcoin, um, and um, you know invested a million of it in, in Ethereum at thirty cents, 
and uh, also nice invested deal. in Made Safe at seven tenths and of a cent. And uh, so, 2014 was really a, a great time to be investing. And Bitcoin to the world, all the headlines were Bitcoin is dead, Bitcoin is dead. Look, it went from $11 up to 1100 now it's down to 200 Dead, dead, dead. It's like, no, it's a cycle. And, you know, you ask a lot of people about Bitcoin now. I mean, the average person is going to say, that's still around? I thought that was a thing, a thing a couple of years ago that like got people rich and then everybody ended up like, you know, losing all their money in a one way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's still the public perception. And of course it's wrong. And, um, and then Ethereum, which, you know, my PR firm um, launched. And we got to launch a lot of the early um, companies just because, you know, I was there as the first PR guy and also, um, you know, one of the founders of, of, of the first version of BitAngel. So I got to see massive deal flow that I also invested in these companies too. So I had a company mm-hmm. like the, the three hats on the event organizer, the uh, PR guy, and the, uh, the investor. And so, mm-hmm. and BitAngels is sort of like just, you know, uh, limped along with us. No worries, no worries. It's that new pro version that the <laughs> camera is there. So, how big is. It's um, comfortable, but big. How big is Bit Angels at the moment? You said. So Bit Angels, right, right now, I think we, I think we have um, uh, I think we got about seven or 800 members. Uh, we're, we're right now in the process of anybody who was an initial member um, for the first couple of years, uh, they should check their email because we're giving them like a full free year, a free membership for a year through the end of 2020 uh, to join sort of the newer one that's going to, you know, eventually be, you know, sort of a membership network, like, you know, some of the other ones out there in other industries. Um, you know, Silicon Valley Blockchain has a membership fee and, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the New York Angels has a membership fee and most angel groups have a membership fee just so that you can like, you know, kind of have a staff to, you know, keep things going. Right. And, um, and, and, and not charge companies to present. We don't charge companies to present. Um, and, um, you know, so we, we're now in 15 cities um, physically, or at least we were until the clamp down. And so the, the restructuring, when David went and started um, after the fund, he went and became uh, chairman of Factum, which is one of the companies that we funded. And um, then he ended up, uh, you know, doing very, very well during the, uh, 2017, 18 years, and um, now runs a family office. And um, uh, YCG, which is, uh, you know, I, I think they market themselves the first family office that exclusively invests in decentralized technologies. And um, so uh, we're still very close and, um, you know, show each other deals and we'll bring things to Bit Angels and I'll mm-hmm. show him things and he obviously checks in on Bit Angels, uh, um, uh, you know, channels. Yeah. So, so here, let's take a question from our audience. Harvey Williams okay. is asking, do you invest in people or in companies? Well, it's a company, but the person is the most important part of the company. Mm-hmm. So I guess the answer to that would be uh, people, because um, if, if, if you have a real rock star proven serial entrepreneur with a okay idea, mm-hmm. um, they can make it work. And if you have a bozo with the best idea in the world, they can make it, they can blow it up. I mean, ideally, you like that both. You like to have a good team and an idea that at least is workable. Um, you know, I, I, you know, having been on both sides of the, of the fence as an investor and as somebody who's taken um, investor money uh, all the way up to Sequoia Capital, I mean, I know what, what kind of questions that I need to ask and that as an entrepreneur, you need to answer. And you know, particularly now, tokenomics are different um, mm-hmm. because that's like investing in silver or gold. It's about scarcity. And I think in the the dot com phase of what we had, um, companies a either got a little bit too creative about how they set their tokenomics, or they just didn't follow through with them. I mean, there were some that said, "Oh, we're going to do this and this and that. Everybody's going to use our token," and they were like, "Well, nobody really wanted to use our token, so we built a company. We're just taking cash." Well, you broke mm-hmm. your model. That's why it didn't work. And that's why your, your tokens died. 
but there are ones that came from that era that I think will, um, that, you know, have stayed successful and Stellar's doing, doing well. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Chainlink's doing well. Um, and they're ones that just stuck to their knitting and, you know, found, um, you know, found something that, uh, that worked and just kept pressing it. Um, you know, we, we, we you know, launched Bancor and Eternity and a number of the, we worked with 120 token sales. And, you know, I think the ones that are still around and, and either doing well or um, have done well and they're now getting ready for their next development, but they, you know, uh, converted their, their, their ether into cash at the right moments. Um, you know, they, um, you know, they're solid entrepreneurs and, and they were able to go and, you know, tweak the vision a few times as the market moved along. And I think that because there's been this sort of, um, absence of, of token sales, um, for the last couple of years, while the SEC gets through its flood attack, um, and finally makes up, you know, their mind about what's a security and what's not, because they haven't made any rules. If you can go to the SEC website, you will not see any proposed rules. You will not see any final rules. You'll only see enforcements. And the enforcements, with the exception of Telegram, don't go to court. They just go and say, hey, we think you sold an unregistered security. Do you want to fight us? It's going to cost you millions of dollars, and we're probably going to seize accounts and assets, or you want to just simply admit you're guilty and, you know, give back, uh, you know, that's what's left of the money and, mm -hmm. and we get to declare victory and you know le, uh, regulation by enforcement is really a sucky thing to do but that's what um you know the sec has done in a few markets over the over the decades and i believe that's what they've done here and i'm hopeful when you know clayton moves on and he's largely believed to you know not take a second term whether trump wins or not we hopefully get someone like hester purse who is much more friendly than they call a crypto mom. Yeah. Um, but you know, yeah, I mean, and you still have to get three of the five votes, but uh, you need the chairman to even take it to a vote. And I think what she proposed um, a few um, months back about the, um, the three year uh, safe harbor was a brilliant solution. It basically is, okay, here's the Howey test as we understand it. It's still a, you know, 1940s test of a 1930s law. So blockchain didn't exist, internet didn't exist, television barely existed back then. And you're still trying to interpret, you know, what um, you're, you're, you're solving problems that are not really the problems of the 30s and 40s, you know, when you had people standing on street corners and selling them stock and then they were printing up more in the basement are not, and nobody had access to any research, uh, are not the problems that you have today. And so I personally think you, you need a new test. But um, if, if, they're, if they seem to think that the Howey test is gospel and you know, no new regulations are required, at least having three years to show whether you're either useful, so you're not purely speculative, even if it's mm -hmm. only for one company that you're useful, or sufficiently decentralized, because those each break one leg of the four-leg Howey test. And so having three years, and at the end of it, if you are seen to be a security, you simply have to get kicked off of the um, exchanges that don't deal with securities. And um, you don't get uh, you know, jailed or anything unless you break any laws. But I think, I think it's pretty simple to, to stay clear of uh, being a security. Don't you know, offer equity, don't offer um, you know, dividends, don't offer performance-driven you know, pieces of the company. I mean, there's, there's pretty simple common sense rules of what is a, st I like to say it, What's a gold mine and what's a gold bar, right? Mm -hmm. A gold bar, bar is a commodity. And the Howey test, um, you know, there are four prongs, not to get too technical, but the four prongs is it has to be an, inv an investment. Um, so you have to have an investment of money. So if you get something for free, um, it's not a security. Um, it's, um, uh, it has to have an expectation of profit. Duh, mm -hmm. everything has an expectation of profit, including... Mm -hmm. You know, buying an antique and buying a, a rental home, and they're not securities. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the two that you really have to look at is: do you have um, uh, any control over the say of management? That's what a sufficiently decentralized comes in. Um, um, and the trickiest one is: if the price of the asset goes up or down, is it because of the active efforts of management or promoters, or 
um, a change in the inherent as, uh, um, supply and demand of the asset. The gold bar, no matter how much, you know, Peter Schiff says, yay gold, yay gold, isn't a security. It goes up because people want it. And obviously right now with all this money printing, people want it. You can't even yeah. find a bar of gold on most of the gold for sale websites, yeah. right? And on the other hand, the ETF is a security. And it's someone managing all these derivatives around this. And if they all ask for the gold at once, they won't be able to deliver because they're, you know, right. 30, 40, 50 X leverage. And so there it's the performance of management. Gold mine is about profits and losses and you're relying on management and the promoters. And if someone says, buy AGX mining company, that's a security and that's a forward looking statement. If you say buy gold, you know, you don't control gold. Yeah. You don't manage gold. And so the question is, you know, there's, uh, Commissioner Hinman said, well, Ethereum may have been a security when they sold it. It's now potentially sufficiently decentralized to not be in anybody's control. You know, and on the other hand, on that fourth leg, and of course, you need all four to be true, uh, to be true to be a security. If if the Talix said, "I'm giving up on, on Ethereum. It was never worth worth anything to begin with," and left, what do you think would pri- happen to the price of Ether? It would tank. It's still yeah, it, yeah, it would tank, right? So yeah. so if it wasn't sufficiently decentralized. Um, you could, you could argue that Vitalik has still has an uh, undue influence on it, whereas no one has an undue influence on the price of gold right. or silver. So now let's talk let's talk about being an angel investor in blockchain. Do you have an investment philosophy or a checklist or process you go through before making an investment? Sure. Um, well, I mean, a lot of my investments are in one of two categories. Um, I like to invest in funds um, so that the, you know, crypto that I have isn't just sitting there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still evaluating a lot of DeFi opportunities. The biggest issue I have with DeFi is the, is the safety of the actual principal, right? I mean, it's great if I can get 8%, I just better be able to get my principal out if, if you go belly up. Right. And, yeah. um, you know, we had an issue with, uh, with, with MakerDAO with, I think, shook a lot of people's confidence in truly decentralized. If you're truly decentralized, you got issues with the code, um, and some other black swan event that, that coders hadn't thought about, like with the yeah. DAO, when uh, code is law and the guy ran off with the money and said, thanks for the money, <laughs> code is law, it's fine. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for the yeah. 60 million. Yeah. So that's the issue with the centralized DeFi, true DeFi. And then the centralized ones, and, and you know, we've represented a number of these companies, and we launched Salt, I'm still a big fan of Salt. Um, you know, and they, 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 they have like, you know, I mean, they're still a very viable concern. They have more money than when they had their ICO. I mean, they're, they're, they're out there doing deals. I'm a big fan of them. Um, but, you know, with anybody like them or Celsius or, uh, uh, or, or Cred or any of these, these folks, you have to look and say, what's the interest and what's the risk, right? Because most of them are not FDIC insured. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they have other regulation and, you know, they can't just run off or they're going to have, you know, a, a hell of a lot of police chasing them. Um, and usually they're not one person companies and they usually have offices and bank accounts and things like that if they're, you know, centralized. Um, so those are interesting. I mean, obviously the same issue with the fund. So you have to really have trust in the fund, the custodians, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, I've been both limited and general partners in funds. So I like funds as a way of sort of, you know, making my crypto work and also not having to go and sit there and say, Oh my God, I went to sleep and I missed a 50% drop or, you know, a yeah. 50% uptick. And then all of a sudden I call up, uh, you know, one of my algo trading funds. And it's like, did you catch it? Yep. Did you catch it? Yep. Did you catch it? Yep. <laughs> oh, phew. Okay. I got my money in the right place. Yeah. And so I've done one, I've done well on funds. So I'm looking at more funds. Um, equity, I have to really, really think you're going to, you know, have a sizable exit in the next you know, three to five years, and it's going to be around, um, you know, sort of the explosion in the next two halvings. Um, because otherwise, I'm not that interested in companies that I think are going to be, I'll be the angel round, and they're going to need an A round, a B round, a C round, a D round. And by the time the next recession comes, um, everybody gets washed out, except for the last money in. That mm-hmm. happens too many times in plays that you know, take too long to, uh, to develop. And so 
I like tokens better than, uh, than equity um, for the reason that um, um, I've done better in them and because um, mm -hmm. I can sell them anytime I want, whereas equity yeah. I can't. Yeah. On the other More hand, liquid. you know, on the other hand, uh, you know, had you bought in when the angel round of Ripple happened, you would have done better once it eventually gets sold to someone or goes public than buying Ripple at all but the very earliest um, amounts. You know, one up to four bucks from, you know, we had, mm -hmm. we had, we had the, the Ripple um, accelerator as a client and they paid us an XRP when I think it was half a penny or something. Oh, so, wow. um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's great getting in early. I look into companies that are early. I look at the token foundations that are early right now. I'm particularly interested in like token foundations that really have cool stuff going on. Um, and I think they're undervalued. Um, I'll, you know, this is not investment advice. You said that to start, mm -hmm. I'll say that for me too, but I've got two companies, um, that I, uh, work with. Um, one, I'm uh, both an investor and an advisor, that's Tempton. And um, I think they potentially could be the size of Ripple. And, you know, right now they're, um, you know, they're, you know, out there on Bit Angels and other places raising money at a, uh, you know, valuation more similar to what uh, Ripple was raising back in 2013. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, they're, um, they're basically a payment token that is looking to be the back end for nations. So in other words, they're programmable um, uh, instant um, payment. So they're instant confirmation, 120,000 transactions per second, fully programmable, and they can back end to a, to a white label. So you could have, for example, uh, uh, a Venezuela token instead of the petrol or um, mm -hmm. You know, let's take a large nation in, in Africa, like Nigeria. You could have a Nigeria token that basically is, you know, backed by their central bank and you take people's cash away and you change it into your cell phone and you're able to go and distribute all your disability checks in one day on your phone, boom, it shows up. And I think the reason why digital dollars, whatever technology they use, um, are so compelling right now is like what India was looking for when they got rid of everything larger than $20 bills, um, you eliminate the black market. If you eliminate mm -hmm. cash and everything goes um, on either a centralized, and it'll all be centralized if it's a, if it's a, a government, it'll be there, but they're, they're, they can track everything. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, they can also choose to make it like cash where it simply can be tracked if you need to, but it's not like reported to you know, every credit bureau every day of every dollar you, you, you spend. But um, uh, with Temptum, they do the back end, and the back end, um, you know, is um, programmable, and it's um, it's uh, it uses it has no fees and uses almost no power, so it uses a speed of light technology. Uh, how's that system. spelled? Temp T E M T U M dot org. T E M M T T E M T U M, and the token right now is only trading. On um, on a small exchange in Asia, but uh, I'm sure that'll be changed shortly. Okay, interesting. So, thank that's, you for that. So that's one. We'll check that. And out. another one, uh, another one that um, I just uh, recently started uh, working with. And I'm very excited about um, is the Telos Foundation, T E L O S, and the token is T L O S. And again, mm -hmm. they're also only on a handful of small exchanges. I mean, one thing I do as an advisor is try to set up meetings with exchanges because. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, I have a lot of exchanges coming saying we want listings and I'm like, okay, what do you have to offer? And so I have to like really do an analysis of, you know, who's someone who used to be great and now they're not, who's pretty good, but you know, you know that if you know the right person, you can get the, you know, the, a, a much better deal than they are offering if you just walk in the front door. And then what, if they're really, you know, um, heavily in demand, like a Binance, um, are they looking for or a Bitrix? I mean, um, you know, what do you have to do with your community? How many wallets do you have to have? You know, all the different criteria that they, they have to do listing on top of your exchange are things that I, I, I are among the top things that I do with advising uh, companies. Um, with Telos, what's interesting is um, if you look at the most dApps of any um, platform blockchain in the world, number one is EOS. 
Number two is Telos. They have more live dApps than Ethereum. Oh, really? Yes. Hmm. <laughs> that was surprising me too. And it, you know, both with, with both, uh, you know, my favorite companies are the ones where my eyebrows go up when they tell me what they do, and I say, "Prove it," and then they mm -hmm. do. And so those are two that, you know, are, are you know, companies that, you know, I, I am working with, I, I am invested in, and, um, um, and, uh, and I like. All right, awesome, awesome. Thank you f f for that. All right, let, let me just check here, the, check in with the audience and see if we have any other questions. So uh, Harvey is saying, what do you think is the potential for crypto in terms of market cap? Do you think it, it can go to $5 trillion? Yes. Question is what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I would say that what you want to look at is um, I don't think we're going to see another situation anytime soon. I could be wrong. Um, where, you know, Bitcoin is only 30% of the market cap like it was during the altcoin um, moon. Um, mm -hmm. I think Bitcoin has its role of digital gold. Um, I don't think it's going to be what people use for day to day transactions. It's just too slow. Um, uh, I think that, you know, Tempton is a really good uh, alternative for that. There's five or six other ones that are, you know, fast. Um, it has to be something where if you're going to go and buy a cup of coffee, you got to leave the coffee shop and they're not waiting for a confirmation 10 minutes. And um, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, there's a number of contenders out there um, for just, you know, payments. Um, there's other ones that are um, platforms that you build other things on, obviously, Ethereum has the early lead on that. EOS has, uh, you know, um, gotten a lot of uh, um, flexibility on what's built, although they've had some issues with this RAM thing coming up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, so I think Telos is a really good alternative to EOS. Um, and then, you know, we there are there are things that we don't even envision yet. I mean, when you were in 1990, you know, when I first saw the internet on the web in 93, um, did I anticipate I'd be doing a Zoom call with you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, some of the main things that were going to be happening. I think what opens the door for, for altcoins, so Bitcoin itself, I think, you know, will probably, my personal projection, it tends to follow these four-year uh, um, trends, just like the U.S. stock market tends to follow these 10-year trends. We have a very slow um you know, bull market that comes after a horrific crash. And it tends to be about a decade long. If you look at your crashes, 29 crash, 89 crash, you know, 2000.com crash, 2008, 2009 crash. This is the longest bull market we've had. And clearly it's a crash right now in 2000, uh, 2020 rather. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's these slow bull markets that the Fed keeps pumping, pumping money in and they keep, uh, you know, going higher and higher. I think it lasts longer this time because Glass Steagall and letting companies buy their own stock back kept you know things yeah, artificially high. Have been but, crazy. Yeah, but all you all, right, all you need is you know one black swan event in, in an already overvalued market, and boy, a coronavirus isn't the black swan event of all time. You know, it's mm -hmm. like it's like a war. You know, um, and uh, so you know we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean. The Fed did what the Fed should do, which is print a hell of a lot of money. That's what they didn't do in the uh, in the in the Great Depression of the '30s. They uh, said, "No, we have to tame inflation. Let's you know keep interest rates high." And you know they kept people unemployed for a decade, and that's not going to happen here. And so that's why the stock market has been preserved for now. Um, but I think that when you get to a point where you're now at almost 100 percent of GDP for um, of, of last year's GDP. Um, for the U.S. dollar, and if you keep printing, you need to keep printing, 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 printing. You might be at 150. I and mean, look, Japan is at 300 percent of the GDP, and there's a lot of uh, you know third world countries that have 300 percent of their GDP increased in the currency every year, which is why you get you know Zimbabwe 100 trillion dollar notes when mm -hmm. the currency yeah. blows up. I don't think we're going to ever have hyperinflation in the U.S. because we're just too big to fail. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that we're going to get to a point where the world um, on its own um, without a war, uh, a Bretton Woods happened because of a war, um, besides that they're going to get off the SWIFT system 
<clears throat> and they're going to go and have multiple ways of having a bucket of currencies as the de facto um, you know, reserve uh, currency for the world, which is right now clearly the dollar. And when you have the dollar, the euro, the RMB, um, all in a bucket, the Swiss franc, um, and you know, I think, I think Bitcoin then becomes part of that bucket, and uh, as a store of value. And every having, you're going to probably have a smaller increase in the exponential curve at the end of their four-year cycles. So they have mm -hmm. four-year cycles um, instead of ten. And instead of a long bull market, you have a long bear market. Bitcoin is dying for most of the four years in the popular press. And then all of a sudden you have a little bit of a turn up and then you have an exponential growth period like you had in 2013 and 2017. And I believe you're gonna have at the end of 2021. It's usually the fourth quarter so far um, after the halving, which yeah. is coming up in less than a month. I mean, uh, month. exciting times, exciting times. I, I, so we actually do have a special as well. So if you're based in the US, we definitely recommend you check out the BitAngels website. So just go to tokenmetrics.com slash bitangels. We have the pleasure of partnering up with Michael and his group. So anybody who's based in Austin, oh, actually Brussels, in Belgium, Chicago, Columbus, Ohio, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Montreal, Phoenix, Philadelphia, New York, Singapore, San Francisco, San Juan, Puerto Rico, or Toronto, Canada. If you're based there, they, I definitely recommend you go out there. Anybody who goes through that link will get 15% 15, 15 off on the membership fees. So, I mean, and, I, and, I, and, and, and honestly, the membership fees, um, you know, are you, you can be in cities other than that. It's just that those are the places that have the physical uh, meetups, but there's a lot of other benefits. Uh, other than, and we're going to be opening up when people are allowed to congregate again in other cities. And, you know, you can then also, um, you know, uh, go and uh, uh, we're going to have a best of cities coming up on the 24th. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, uh, that's, that's I think, the uh, first come, first serve. I have to check with uh, Erica. I don't think that one is, uh, if, it, if, it's a, if it's a fee, it's pretty cheap, and she'll add it to your, mm -hmm. to your list if, it, if there is a fee. It's very small. Now, Coin Agenda, two days before that. Yeah. So can you kind of tell us about Coin Agenda and also the virtual event coming up? Sure. So, so Coin Agenda is a conference. Uh, it's one of the only... Uh, it's one of the two oldest uh, uh, Bitcoin conferences in the world. The other one being the North uh, uh, North American Bitcoin Conference uh, in Miami, which was January 2014. And Coin Agenda has been coming going on uh, a couple times a year since um, uh, 2014 um, uh, in October. So um, we hold the annual global conference in October. Um, hopefully, we'll still be able to hold it physically in Las Vegas. We hold a Caribbean conference in, right here in beautiful uh, San Juan. Puerto Rico. I have to take the opportunity to go and uh, show you uh, my view from my uh, desk. Oh, yeah, please there's, do. Um, there's Miramar, <laughs> there's Condado Lagoon, Condado Beach, and the island at least the old San Juan. Mm -hmm. Oops. Go around again. Yeah, great weather. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's actually a little toasty today. It was almost 90, um, but, uh, but not too humid. So, um, yeah, so. Uh, We've had, you know, uh, also Asian um, events. We had one in Singapore. We had uh, uh, European events in, in Barcelona and in uh, Malta. Our first, uh, our, our first Malta event. Uh, we actually uh, had the uh, premiere of Malta debuted uh, the the program for uh, for their uh, cryptocurrency um, in Puerto Rico. The premiere of uh, Bermuda, actually Prime Minister of Malta, the premiere of Bermuda debuted their program. Uh, big fan of uh, what, what they're doing in Bermuda. I actually have a, uh, uh, an entity in Bermuda called uh, Transform Studios that when the token market comes back, it's a, it's a way of uh, we'll be able to help U.S. companies uh, um, build a blockchain in Puerto Rico and block U.S. investors through a, a, a Bermuda tie. And it's an it's a interesting model that uh, every lawyer and accountant I've run past loves it. So um, when the market yeah. comes back. <laughs> Now, um, can the, you coin, kind of... the coin agenda, yeah, sorry, coin agenda again is is where we go in. I started coin agenda because I was speaking at a lot of these conferences about investing, and I would I would invite non crypto investors, and I'd say, here, learn about Bitcoin. Come to the North American Bitcoin. Watch my panel. Come to this. Watch my panel. And I said, what do you think? And I said, well, I loved your panel. Uh, there was a bunch of other you know people talking a lot of sense or loved your keynote or whatever. But 
everything else, I had no idea what they're talking about. They're talking about programming, they're talking about consensus models, they're talking about all this geeky stuff. And so I thought there needs to be a conference that's only about investing. And that's what Coinage Up is. And so that's been going on for seven years now. And because, um, you know, we can't do physical events right now, we decided to start Coinage Up Presents, which is a monthly um, Zoom conference. And I think we've got up to 200 seats available. And that's on uh, April 24th. And our first one is going to be about, uh, you know, uh, crypto in the time of coronavirus. And we got really pleased to have Bruce Fenton, um, who's the um, former uh, executive director of the Bitcoin Foundation and head of Satoshi Roundtable. And he's been doing this amazing work um, crowdsourcing um, ventilators um, mm -hmm. uh, using what he's kind of learned in open source technology. Uh, he's been all over the news lately. And then we also have a panel that includes the uh, CEO, um, Ben Gritzman uh, of uh, Singularity Net, who's also doing. Um, some uh, crowdsourced uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, solutions. And um, um, what's back on that panel? Um, I've, got, uh, I've got a couple other people on the panel as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's on the site. It sounds great. It's on sounds the site. great. Yeah. So just go to coinagenda.com to access oh, all that Eric, information. Eric, 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 Eric Benz from the CEO of ChangeLake is also on that panel. Okay. So we've got people uh, calling in from, uh, uh, he's in London. Uh, Bruce is in New Hampshire, and uh, um, Ben will either be in uh, Hong Kong or in uh, Seattle. Awesome, awesome. So typically on the show, we have some questions we like to ask our guests as well. So mm -hmm. first question is, what are three books you've read that have inspired you or changed your life? Hmm. Well, I'd recommend it. I, would, I, was, I was already, you know, deep into uh, Bitcoin by the time that I read this book, but uh, I <clears throat> highly recommend for anybody who wants to understand Bitcoin to read uh, the Bitcoin Standard, uh, which mm -hmm. came out in 2018. I think, it's a, I think it's the best book out there to read about Bitcoin in terms of just really understanding the economics of it. Um, Digital Gold by Nathaniel Popper is also very good in terms of a story like, but in terms of like just inspiring me, um, you know, I've, I've always loved, um, 100 years of solitude to just sort of, um, you know, see how deep and rich, um, you know, uh, the life of a family and a community can be. And, um, and also just to get a, a grasp of how, um, you know, other cultures like South America, you know, sort of tell stories. I mean, I, I'm still amazed that that has not been made into a, a movie or a miniseries. It's one of the great books of all time for, for nonfiction, I mean, for fiction. Mm -hmm. um, for nonfiction, um, you know, I, um, I, I've always been a great fan of the, the late Wayne Dyer. Um, uh, he wrote a book, Your Erroneous Zones, and he's written five or six other ones. And, you know, they call them, quote, self-help books, but uh, they're just really, you know, um, interesting ways of, you know, thinking about your life. And it, it's all perspective, right? It's all sort of uh, glasses half empty, glasses half full. But if you have somebody to really um you know put it in a compelling way that makes sense to you and you know i've read a lot of those books whatever I hear there's one that's really good i mean magic of thinking big by david schwartz is a good one um you know uh and um uh and then also the late uh, uh stephen covey um mm -hmm. you know i think um you know um first things first um is, is a great book and that was came from the uh, that was the first of the rules of the seven uh, secrets of or seven rules of successful people. I forget the full title. Yeah, seven habits of highly effective people. Seven habits, right? Seven mm -hmm. habits of highly effective people, right? Um, but first things first is like you know, do the most important thing first. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty simple, but you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big reader, and uh, I try to read things, you know, first and foremost that can uh, make me more efficient, improve my life. Uh, you know, getting things done was a good one for being organized. Uh, I'm a creative, so creatives sometimes have a tough time being organized. We have to, you know, sort of like go into, okay, I'm going to go into creative mode. Now I'm going to like turn everything off and just realize that I have to be doing contracts and not thinking about, you know, expanding my ideas. I have to just go into like, and what helps me when I'm going into non-creative mode into sort of execution mode is just, you know, having, you know, good, monotonous jazz music in the back. 
something that I know really well so that I don't say it can't have any lyrics or it'll distract me. But, you know, um, and then I'll, I'll wear the grooves out of something and then I'll start with something new. Mm -hmm. And um, I think lately I've been playing a lot of uh, El Daniola. Before that, I was playing a lot of Grover Washington. Uh, before that, I was playing a lot of Jan Hammer. Before that, I was playing a lot of uh, um, Sean Luponti, so um, John McLaughlin. So, you know, yeah. just, uh, All right. So uh, next question. Who are, peop who are three people outside your family and friends in history, past or present, that inspire you? Oh, boy. Um, well, I live in Puerto Rico, so I can't vote for president. Um, but I would <laughs> say that uh, um, I think Barack Obama does not get enough credit for, for what he did in terms mm -hmm. of uh, having eight years of scandal-free administration um, in terms of uh, doing a lot for the entrepreneurial class in terms of uh, being able to institute a lot of the uh, small business programs that are out there now. The Jobs um, Act? Uh, yeah, the Jobs Act, but also uh, um, you know, making the uh, qualified small business uh, stock uh, permanent. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, anybody who's out there as an investor or as a company, if you're a C-Corp, and you invest in it, or you issue your um, uh, uh, stock to your employees, and they hold on to it for five years in one day, you pay no taxes, no federal taxes on the first five million, I believe, be either considering or have or, or have raised that to 10 million. And mm. What's that, that called? That's, that, it's, it's called QSBS, Qualified Small Business Stock. See, even you didn't know about it. I mean, it's no, like yeah. there's so many investors that don't Very know about it. It's, yeah. it's, I have to check that out. Uh, yeah, and it, and, and it used to be, it was around for a while, but it wasn't that meaningful because you had alternative minimum stock would, would offset. It was only 50%. And then they finally said 0% and no alternative minimum was supply. You start a company and you sell it for a lot of money. You as the founder also get the same, the same benefit. So if you have an investor, and you're the founder, you both get the first $5 million, and I think it'll soon be $10 million, absolutely free of federal tax. And you wow. live in a state like Florida or Nevada, huge. there goes that tax. It's almost as good as living in Puerto Rico. <laughs> okay. Um, then next question. What are three actions you took that have transformed your life? I'm guessing Puerto Rico is up there? Puerto Rico is up there. Um, Nevada is up there. And um, and then probably um, you know starting uh, starting my first entrepreneurial pursuit, which was uh, you know putting my shingle up uh, to start my first PR firm. Now, got me working for myself instead of for other people. Yeah. Now can, then, can you kind my, of can you can you kind of explain why that's big and also why Puerto Rico was big? Because I don't think everybody knows the benefits of going to Puerto Rico. Oh, sure. Because you're there yeah, now, so, so is Brock, so is Peter Schiff. Lots of people yeah, are yeah. down there. Yeah, I, I was the first person to move from the uh, from the crypto community in the early 2016. Um, Brock calls me patient zero. Um, Brock <laughs> came down with a boatload of people right after Hurricane Maria, um, late December of 2017. And late December of 2017, uh, got an, an armada coming in for, an, for a couple of other reasons. Um, uh, primarily that they changed the law in, in starting in January of 18 um, uh, of where uh, you literally um, cannot go and you used to be able to go and trade things um, of like kind and not have to pay the tax on it. So in other words, you could go and buy Bitcoin for $5 years ago and then buy Ethereum with that Bitcoin for 30 cents, and then buy an ICO when, when Ethereum is up to $1,000, and not pay any taxes until you sell for fiat money that final ICO. After wow. 2018, mm -hmm. um, you have to pay tax on every single transaction. So if you had Bitcoin at $5, mm -hmm. and you end up um, even selling that, I mean, even uh, you spend that Bitcoin on another investment, you have to pay immediately the tax of your profit on that investment, yeah. even though you hadn't sold anything for that. Crypto is being treated as, as a property. Well, it's it's more than that. It's huh? it's that it, it is property, but it used to be exempt, like real estate is, mm -hmm. um, using the um, uh, 
the exemption of like for like property. So in other words, mm -hmm. you can go and <clears throat> buy a home and sell it and not pay tax on it if you're putting into a similar home and mm -hmm. um, then keep on doing there's a real estate, I forget the number of that, a 133 exemption or something like that. Um, and you used to be able to, to use that exemption for crypto and now you can't. So now mm -hmm. all of a sudden that really crimp trading because you all of a sudden you had to go and sell things and I think that was another reason why we had the crash in 2018. People all of a sudden couldn't just simply shuffle back and forth and, and, and day trade without having a company as a mechanism to be able to, you have to really, if you don't move to Puerto Rico, you have to have a company as a mechanism to do that trading. And otherwise you're having personal tax every time you go and buy and sell any crypto asset, the trader should know that. Mm -hmm. um, you should set up if you're not in Puerto Rico. Um, and Puerto Rico uh, is great because we have uh, what's known as Act 60 now, which combines several other acts that were um, passed in 2012. Um, Act 22 and Act uh, 20 are the primary, primarily best known ones. Um, Act 22 is if you're an investor, including an angel investor, and you move to Puerto Rico and you are a bona fide resident of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico meaning you live here half the year, and there's actually some nice um, uh, um, sort of credits toward those 183 days mm -hmm. that makes it easy to live here where you think you're only living here during the winter, but you're actually here legally 183 days. They give you 30 days credit for being outside of the United States. So you go to France for a month, that, that, that first 30 days counts as being in Puerto Rico. If there's any oh, wow. FEMA disaster, if there's any FEMA declared disaster, mm -hmm. which is, there's been one every year I've been here except the first year, um, <laughs> you get a minimum of 14 days. Last year, Hurricane Dorian, um, you know, wiped out the Bahamas, but it touched Puerto Rico and did a little damage in Fajardo. They declared, they declared it a disaster. I got 14 free days. Um, so all of a sudden you go from having to be here 183 days to 153 days to if there's a disaster, it's even a minor one. Like this year we had the, uh, the earthquake. That was a disaster. Um, you're now down all of a sudden to like, you know, uh, you're about four and a half months. Four and a half months is winter. And the other thing is the one minute a day rule. One minute a day in, in Puerto Rico counts as a full day. So within that winter, you could go on a Monday morning and fly to New York and fly back Tuesday night. And it's no days away from Puerto Rico, zero. You do that wow. every week. That's or incredible. if you go and fly yeah. once a month for four days, um, you only count the two days that you're not there even one minute. My first year, because I... I had to make up some time at the end of the year. It was a very rainy season, but there were no declared emergencies, even though flights were canceled. Um, I had to make up some days in a hurry. So what I did was I would fly to New York through San Juan, land on Saturday night, take off on Sunday morning, count as two days. Nice, nice. So, so those, those are little tricks. But then for that, yeah. your benefit is you pay zero capital gains. So, so, so that's still active because I heard that there were probably going to close the window? Was it extended? No, um, it was extended. Um, what they did was every year they make it a little bit tougher. Mm -hmm. So it's still zero, but when I came, all I had to do was buy a house within two years. And they didn't say what the minimum price is. And they didn't say you had to live in it. So um, <laughs> I could have, because there were people during that era who literally just had a little apartment down here. Um, and then they had a corporation that owned a big house in New York or Connecticut or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, they bought a house down here for $20,000 and rented it out to someone and they fulfilled their responsibilities. Um, <clears throat> they then changed it where you didn't have to buy a house, but you had to give a $5,000 a year um, donation to charity. Mm -hmm. um, now this year was uh, the new law, which is you have to buy a home and you have to give a $10,000 per year donation to charity. So it just simply means that the no, the number of capital gains you plan on averaging over the next 15 years, because it's through 2035, mm -hmm. just goes up a little bit higher in terms mm -hmm. of like what you think is worth, you know, uprooting your life and moving to paradise yeah. in the Caribbean. Now, do you have any tips or places people who have an interest in this can, can check out in terms of going to Puerto Rico as investors? Well, uh, you just missed the uh, coinage on the Caribbean, uh, which was right before the lockdown in, in February. But um, yeah, there's um, um, 
so I'll, I'll, I'll give a plug for my tax lawyer, geo.tax, uh, Giovanni Mendez. He speaks at every uh, point in Gen the Caribbean. He's spoken at a couple of the ones in the mainland. Um, I think he's the best tax lawyer on the island, and he, he's amassed with all this stuff. And he'll send you a uh, document, so geo.tax, pretty okay. easy to remember. Awesome, awesome. I've just pulled up his site. So geo.tax, Tax yep. Saving Strategies, Puerto Rico, Act 2022. Yep. Awesome. And 22, 22, you don't have to move here. Um, it's, it, 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 it's um, um, but you have to have the work done here. So mm -hmm. if you have a factory um, or you have something um, uh, that is not your personal work, but it's, um, you know, done by people in Puerto Rico, um, um, you can go and set it up here, have the work done in Puerto Rico, and um, it pays 4% tax and nothing to the IRS. Uh -huh. And one, st one strategy that I've seen uh, employed is mm -hmm. where you're thinking that you might want to move down to Puerto Rico at some point, but right now your kids are in school or whatever. You set this thing up, you go in, you have a C Corp down here, um, just you know, pay its 4% tax and stockpile in cash. And then mm -hmm. you move down here before the end of the of the of the decree. Um, you know, don't make it the last year, right? Like, you know, like maybe you move in 2030 or something like that. And you then, as a bona fide Puerto Rican resident, you get to go and give yourself all the money with no tax because you're Act 20 and dividends from your own company or any mm -hmm. other company are free. So the the money after you move down there or the money you've been sending down there? The right. money that is in your your Act 22 company, mm -hmm. um, which has been sitting in a C-Corp mm -hmm. and you're an owner of it, as soon as you move down there, you can take all that stuff because it's already paid its 4% tax mm -hmm. and you're now a Puerto Rico-based shareholder. And again, you know, double check to see if the laws have changed yeah. with the with geo dot tax. But I know for a while that was a strategy where you would then move down there and simply pay yourself a uh, a dividend from that active company. I mean, sounds great. I, I'm definitely due to come down there. <laughs> so, Please do. Once we open up, uh, yeah. happy to give you the tour. When's the next Coin Agenda conference in Puerto Rico or Caribbean? So, so the next Coin Agenda conference in Puerto Rico, we have it every. Um, uh, February, late February, early March. So okay. don't have a date for that yet. No. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, looking at, I'm thinking about maybe doing something down here. I've got, um, I've got this, you know, um, condo that, uh, I live in, in the city and, um, my wife was British, um, wanted to get a country house. And so we're, uh, the construction stopped now because of the, uh, the virus, but, um, we've been building out this, uh, she likes wrecks and rebuilding them, but we've got this, you know, fourteen thousand square foot place on like seven acres in the in the in the um, uh, in the rainforest, uh, not too far from the city. And mm -hmm. um, so, when that's done, I'm thinking about maybe doing a mastermind down there. That sounds great. Sounds great. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Michael. It was a pleasure having you on. So once again, please go to coinagenda.com to sign up for the upcoming virtual event. And also, please go to tokenmetrics.com slash bitangels to check out and join the, the BitAngel group. Uh, I mean, we, we all know Michael is an, is an OG in the space, a legend. So if you want to kind of be close to that and, and just learn how they invest and how they really are just really heavily involved in the blockchain space, definitely recommend you check out their live events and also their, their BitAngels group. And, and can, also, you can con ahead. you can connect with me on on, on, on LinkedIn, on Telegram, um, I'm on all the uh, all the various social networks. Um, I, I will say that uh, this week I am really angry at Twitter, and uh, maybe we can have an offline conversation. Um, Twitter had, Twitter had a couple of bugs uh, a few weeks ago, and they were just throwing yes. people off. And you had to I saw go that. back on with your yeah. So I because I was famously hacked by uh, AT and by, by a mm -hmm. gang that was using AT and T, and I had my Two hundred twenty-four million dollar lawsuit against them. Mm -hmm. I've taken all my old numbers and I've made them into virtual numbers, and mm -hmm. that one of those those virtual numbers don't work with the Twitter automatic proof who you are sim thing, mm -hmm. and so it won't let me back on. And customer service, my assistant and me are both four times a day saying, "Here's the thing. I just need to either have you call this number that'll work, or you you have a person go and text it, but your bot doesn't work with it." and nothing just we will add this to your case file we will add this to your case <laughs> file so you can retweet me 
Um, but it, but if you go to my site, it'll say this is currently a you know suspended or or inactive or whatever yeah. troubled account, and it's not because of anything I did. It's because of Twitter's inability to uh, deal with uh, VoIP, which is shocking, and also to have any customer service at all. Yeah, and you you also mentioned Telegram and some other platforms people can find you on. Uh, yeah, I'm at Michael Turpin on everything. Everything, okay. And and uh, yeah, and, and on uh, Instagram, there's apparently a whole bunch of fake Michael Turpins trying to scam people. Make sure that it's spelled correctly: M I C H A E A E L T E R P I N, not three eyes or two eyes or. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Michael. It was great having you and take care. Best of luck. And I'll be in touch as well. And thank you, everybody. Okay. Please reshare okay. this video and like with your friends. And as we, like to, as we like to say, the moon is not the limit to the moon and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Token Metrics is a cryptocurrency investment platform that helps users leverage machine learning to become better crypto investors. Our in-depth analysis helps eliminate the emotions of investing, find profitable investment opportunities, and filters out scams. Learn more at tokenmetrics.com. Disclaimer. Tokenmetrics Media LLC does not provide individually tailored investment advice and does not take a subscriber's or anyone's personal circumstance into consideration when discussing investments. Nor is it registered as an investment advisor or broker-dealer in any jurisdiction. Information contained herein is not an offer or solicitation to buy, hold, or sell any security. The Tokenmetrics team has advised and invested in many blockchain companies. A complete list of their advisory roles and current holdings can be viewed here at tokenmetrics.com.